There are different types of wetlands in Minnesota. There's actually eight different types of wetlands. Uh, the wetlands here primarily in this uh, area are going to be type twos and type sixes, um, which are you know, kind of a fresh meadow. That's the, you know, the grassy areas that you're seeing behind me, but also the shrub areas are what they consider type six. This is important because um, all those different types are you know, throughout the state of Minnesota and they all have their different functions and values. But the Wetland Conservation Act, which was uh, instituted in 1991, really was a game changer for the state of Minnesota. And at that point, there was uh, the legislature decided, a bipart you know, on a bipartisan vote, that wetlands were important enough for many different reasons uh, that they needed to be protected. We're standing at the Blaine Wetland Sanctuary in uh, Central Blaine, Minnesota, and it's a 500 and about 20 acre site of open space that is predominantly wetland. The Blaine Wetland Sanctuary probably wouldn't be here if it wasn't for, at least it wouldn't be looking like this if it wasn't for the Wetland Conservation Act. It contains some upland islands that are sandy, but the wetlands are mostly what we call peatland. And the peats here range from just a few inches deep to over 25 feet in depth. This whole uh, landscape called the Anoka Sand Plain was formed under a uh, series of glacial, large glacial lake events. And glacial lakes are where the meltwater from glaciers as they are receding and melting gets backed up behind an impoundment, a large impoundment, and forms uh, large um, and deep glacial lakes. And so we're standing at the bottom of a glacial lake that was 50 to 100 feet deep. So for the last 6,000 years, at this site, the grasses have been growing in the water, the sedges have been growing in the water, they've been dying back and, and falling into the water and forming peat layer by layer, you know, a millimeter per year uh, for thousands of years. And we know this from looking at the soils, we know this from lots of scientific studies, and for thousands of years this has been a grassland wetland system. So. Fast forward to about 150 years ago when Minnesota was first being settled by European settlers and landscapes like this were predominantly wetland but were starting to be converted for agriculture and, uh, and settled you know, as farms and settlements. Uh, ditches were put in in the 1920s to help, um, to help promote agriculture and to try to farm these areas. And in fact, during the, what we call it, the Dust Bowl of the 1920s and 30s, the wetlands were the most productive areas because they had some water left in them and the uplands, the sandy uplands of the Noka Sand Plain were too dry to even farm. And so there was a lot of attempts to convert these areas to agriculture in the 20s and 30s that were then abandoned in the 40s and, and, and then on because they got too wet after that. So since the 20s and 30s, this site went from a, a, a ditched and kind of agricultural hay field pasture and with some row crops in it to abandon and fallow. And the ditching and then the suppression of uh, frequent fire in this landscape from settlement resulted in the establishment of fast growing lowland trees like aspen, birch, um, cottonwood, and then green ash. So that is why we know for the last about 70 years, sites like this and all throughout Blaine have been uh, become very wooded where for thousands of years they've been open grassland and savanna. A large part of the restoration of this larger 500 acre site is designed around removing these trees that don't belong here, reintroducing, uh, well, removing the, all the accumulated biomass from the suppression of fire. And that could be trees, shrubs, and a lot of grasses and sedges. So they can be a feet of biomass over the peat. And then running a uh, frequent fire through the system to reestablish what we call a natural disturbance regime. About 80 percent of the trees that were removed happened to be green ash, uh, a species of kind of lowland tree, 
And as many of you probably know or are aware by now, green ash is being um, decimated right now by emerald ash borer. And so um, while it was a really drastic change to the aesthetic of this place, the way that it looked, it was um, really a preemptive um, move to remove these trees before they died and became even greater fire hazards and impediments to managing this site with prescribed fire. The burning essentially favors the things that belong here and works against the things that don't belong here. Um, probably the most problematic species that remains here is actually a grass called reed canary grass and that is um, actually a native grass to Minnesota but it's kind of gone wild. Uh, we don't we still don't really know why it's, it's taking over Minnesota's wetlands. Um, if it's a genetic thing or a disturbance thing or a climate change thing, but we're trying to, it doesn't really like fire and we can manage it with fire, whereas all the other native grasses and sedges and wildflowers here tend to really like uh, prescribed burning. And so what we found, what's really unique about this site and a few other sites in the city of Blaine is that Underneath all of this accumulated, the tree litter, the leaf litter, the thatch, is a seed bank in the peat that's native and diverse. So there could be 300 species of native things right here in the soil, in the peat soil, that just needs to be exposed to the sun. But because of, of lack of fire across most of this uh, sand plain landscape, that these species have been suppressed. And, and the lack of fire favors a few very dominant species. And so we're taking this site from a very stagnant, species poor system back to a very dynamic and managed and uh, species diverse uh, system. We keep finding more and more plant species out here. Um, some very rare things that, again, have not, we have not seen out here in the 20 years or 15 years prior to burning that we've been out here. And then uh, just a few years after burning, these things like uh, ragged fringed orchid and uh, twisted yellow-eyed grass and endangered species, sundews out here that are a carnivorous species, they're out in the, in the peatland. So there's um, a whole host, probably about 300 species of, of plants out here. And many of them are, have their own really interesting stories. We have to remember that this took a century for this to degrade, so it's not going to be restored in three years or five years. It might take a decade or two to really get it where we want it. This is a large system, a lot like, say, Cedar Creek, uh, and a little bit like Carlos Avery, parts of Carlos Avery, and Sherburne National Wildlife Refuge. These are a few of the last landscapes in the Anoka Sampling that are being burned regularly. And so that burning allows for a different kind of habitat that used to be ubiquitous and is now very rare. Because we have this management regime here of fire and we have little, very few trees and a lot of herbaceous species and, and wildflowers, we have types of wildlife that are showing up here that we can't find anywhere else in the, the surrounding city or cities and only can find in um, these, these fire managed landscapes like Cedar Creek, like Carl Savory and Sherburne National Wildlife Refuge. So we really have a real biodiversity gem here in the center of the city of Blaine. As far as wetland banks, so because of the Wetland Conservation Act, we had to find ways to replace the wetlands that were being permitted because there were impacts associated with development and uh, with farming and things like that. So one of the things that they determined and came up with was uh, a couple different ways to mitigate those uh, wetland impacts. And one of them was on-site mitigation where people actually create wetlands on site, but it was also a provision to allow for people to uh, restore or enhance wetlands and actually bank those wetlands. And so what happens, that's kind of totally on the, it's a, a private um, process that between the applicant and the bank sponsor, but they're able to sell those credits on the market um, at their 
they can set the price at whatever they might be um, per square foot. Of course, up in northern Minnesota, those credits are not maybe worth as much because there's not as much impact. In the metro area, they can get, get to be quite, you know, uh, valuable. And so uh, some cities have actually taken the opportunity to do wetland banks and doing so have been kind of created a little bit of a revenue source for themselves. It would be um, in the millions of dollars over the course of the project. And again, these are not tax dollars um, from the city of Blaine or from the residents of Blaine. These are um, mitigation fees or, you know, for buying these credits for replacing wetlands that are lost, whether it's in the city of Blaine, within the Rice Creek Watershed District, or perhaps even in other counties, other, other cities and municipalities are buying credits from Blaine uh, for wetland impacts that are happening, say in Hennepin County or um, Ramsey County. This wetland banking, the fact that, that there are credits being generated for this to replace um, wetland loss elsewhere, it generates revenue that otherwise just wouldn't be here to even start this project, let alone manage it for decades to come. So I'm an ecologist, I'm a restoration ecologist uh, with, with degrees in, in landscape ecology and landscape architecture. And so this site is as much about pl places for wildlife and biodiversity as it is places a place for people. And we like to think that we're really balancing that out. Uh, the, the fact that we have a mile long trail through here with more miles of trails planned all the way down to 109th is, is an incredible, I think, accomplishment and really brings the people in to this otherwise inaccessible place while still balancing that with a, a really important um, mission to provide habitat for hundreds, if not a thousand different species of plants, animals, insects, this whole system is intertwined. Every species is intertwined to the next. And we can't possibly know the importance of every species that plays in, in uh, the lives of, of all other species and of the human population. And all we know is that we're losing this biodiversity at a record pace um, due to development, due to um, stagnation, degradation, uh, invasive species and those kind of things. There's a whole set of functions and values that every wetland has. Uh, stormwater attenuation is one. Uh, wildlife uh, habitat is definitely, in fact, we just um, are hearing that right now from the pheasant in the background. Um, there is uh, aesthetic values. There are values of open space. Um, water quality is a huge one um, because whenever there's a rain event, the wetlands tend to mitigate that going downstream too fast and causing issues in streams and rivers and lakes. One additional very important function that the Blaine Wetlands Sanctuary has served and we envision will serve in the future is a home for endangered and threatened plant species that are being uh, lost due to local development within Anoka County and within Blaine. And this site was the first site to receive a permit from the Minnesota DNR to receive rare plants from nearby developments. And in collaboration with those developers and the DNR and the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum, Noka Conservation District in the city of Blaine, we organized volunteer events to go salvage these plants from the development prior to them being taken and transplant them into the Blaine Latin Sanctuary where we are now monitoring the success of, the, of those transplants. So this is really important uh, movement forward in the conservation of rare plant species within Blaine and the Anoka Sand Plain and, and the larger state of Minnesota. And the Blaine Wetland Sanctuary is a really important site, protected site to receive these plants. We don't anticipate moving forward that this site will visually look all that different. Um, the, most of the dramatic transformation has happened. Um, we have managed the trees that don't belong here. We've removed those. We've um, accomplished some of the first burns. The long-term plans for the Blaine Wetland Sanctuary include additional trails 
um, heading south off the central island down to 109th and servicing some of the neighborhoods um, around 109th. We anticipate moving forward just more boardwalks and uh, continued prescribed burning and uh, really it's going to keep kind of looking the way it looks now just more get, getting more diverse. There is an incredible use of the boardwalk. There's an incredible um, appreciation um, for the, the diversity out here, the bird species that people are seeing, the insects, those kind of things. And it is a really unique opportunity for people to get away from traffic and away from development within the heart of Blaine. I'm often asked why should people care about the Blaine Wetland Sanctuary and the work that we're doing here and there's lots of reasons why. Um, but to summarize, I think that this is an incredibly unique project and the scale of it is just unprecedented within the Twin Cities metro area, especially within a developing community. It's 500 acres of not just set aside open space, but restored and actively and permanently managed open space that's biodiverse that provides recreational opportunities um, throughout the year, th that that is just um, not being done in many other communities throughout the state of Minnesota. I think these areas that are remaining, especially these bigger areas that really provide, really are producing you know, benefits beyond just the wildlife habitat or just the intrinsic value of the, of the site, actually is providing you know, some uh, probably water quality functions and things like that for the the uh, water, water bodies around here, that it's, it's I think gonna become even more and more precious as the years go by. I think we're gonna look back and be like, we're so glad we you know, decided that this was important enough to, to preserve.